morning. Good morning. Good morning. Our prelude this morning is a song called Rise Again. It's told from the perspective of Christ on the cross, speaking to those at the foot of the cross and others. It is a message that has propelled forward over thousands and thousands of years, but it's still very, very simple. Today, on Easter, Resurrection Sunday, we sing a song to put your mind in the place where they were when it happened.
So one of the things that we do is understand. Pastor John likes to quote, there is, without the shedding of blood, there is no removal of sin. And this is very true. So when we sing this next song, Power in the Blood, embrace that that shedding of blood was the one thing that made going and living your life in victory here and in the future possible.
text for this morning is found in the Gospel of John, chapter 19, beginning with verse 41 through the 18th verse of chapter 20. At the place where Jesus was crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden a new tomb, in which no one had ever been laid. Because it was the Jewish day of preparation, and since the tomb was nearby, they laid Jesus there. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved, and said, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have put him. So Peter and the other disciple started for the tomb. Both were running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent over and looked in at the strips of linen lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came along behind him and went straight into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen lying there as well as the cloth that had been wrapped around Jesus' head. The cloth was still lying in its place, separate from the linen. Finally, the other disciple who had reached the tomb first also went inside. He saw and believed. They still did not understand from the scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to where they were staying. Now Mary stood outside the tomb crying. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb and saw two angels in white, seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and the other at the foot. They asked her, woman, why are you crying? They have taken my Lord away, she said. And I don't know where they have put him. At this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not recognize that it was Jesus. He asked her, woman, why are you crying? Who is it you're looking for? Thinking he was the gardener, she said, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have put him, and I will get him. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned toward him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said, Do not hold on to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and to your God. Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news. I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. Thank you, Dave. So good to have you here with us this morning. Along with my son, Blake. Good to see you guys sitting in the front row. So good to see so many faces. New faces, long-weighted faces. So good to see you today. This is a great day in Christendom, a great day in history. All God's people are gathered across this nation and around the world to celebrate Christ's crucifixion. The day he was crucified on the cross and let all his blood run out into the dirt because he loves you. He forgives your sin. The blood of the Lamb wipes clean all your wrong, all your guilt, all your shame, all your brokenness. Clean! And then He rose from the dead, conquering death, offering us eternal life. What a great thing God the Father has done through His Son, Jesus Christ, forgiving us. Because if you're honest with yourself, you need forgiveness. Amen. You need to be forgiven. You are a broken, shameful, pitiful bunch. <laughs> and all the scripture says that all have sinned 
All are broken. All are filled with shame and guilt. All have sinned and fallen short of God's perfect standard. But God didn't want to leave us in our sin. He didn't want to leave us in our shame or our brokenness. So he said to Jesus, you got to go down there. And you got to rescue my people. We're going to forgive them. We're going to make them clean. We're going to make them new. Like the Apostle Paul said, all things have become new for those who believe in Jesus Christ. You have become a new creature in Christ. Your life can be new, can be different, can be fresh, can be filled with peace and joy and purpose. When I surrendered my heart to Christ at 23 years old, that's desperately what I needed. I needed some clarity. I needed some forgiveness. I needed some purpose. I surrendered to the Lord Jesus. I knew what the story was up here, being the son of a pastor. Grew up in the church. I knew the story. I could tell you the story. But knowing the story and believing on Jesus Christ and putting your faith and trust in Him for your soul and your life and your eternity is different. Amen. That's a different moment. And I hope that all of you come to that moment today if you have not. It's a simple transaction of believing in Jesus. Now in today's story in the Gospel of John, we see that his followers, Peter and John and Mary from Magdala, on the day he rose from the dead, they were a bit confused. They were a bit skeptical. And I thought it would be good to bring up this story today because it lets us know that, you know what? Sometimes as we look at the story of Jesus about the cross and him bleeding out and the Romans gambling for his clothes and then he was put into a borrowed men's tomb, a rich men's tomb there in the garden by the skull, by the cross where he was crucified, the hill of the skull. And we wonder, what is that about? What is that story about? It, it's, it's very Christian, it's very worldwide, it's very world known, but what does that mean for me? And even his followers who knew who he was and believed in who he was were a bit confused, a bit skeptical. And we're going to look at that story for a few minutes this morning. Let's pray together before we begin. Heavenly Father, it's a wonderful thing to be in your house on a sunny Sunday morning. We're so grateful to be here and to think of what your son Jesus Christ did at the cross and the way he rose from the tomb and the stone was rolled away. What a wonderful story. And it, it was so poignant what I read this week from the Apostle John when he said, See what great love the Father has lavished on us in His Son, Jesus Christ. That statement just captures the whole story. God the Father sent the Son because He loves you. He loves you, forgives you, wants to heal your brokenness, and give you a future, give you a hope, give you eternal life. And so, Father, as we review the piece of the story that John told, the, your story is in each of the Gospels, as we look at this piece this morning, I pray that the Holy Spirit would help our hearts open to the truth of your Son. It's not a fad, it's not a myth, it's not religion, it's the truth. Your Son came, died, and rose from the dead, because we desperately needed that kind of help on this planet. So, Lord, open our eyes today, and we're so thankful. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So we're in the Gospel of John, at the tail end of chapter 19, and I wanted to start with this verse, the last verse in the chapter, because it sets the stage for going into that morning when Christ rose from the dead. His followers, like Mary from Magdala, and his close disciples, Peter and John, they were all a bit mystified that morning as they went to the tomb and saw the stone roll away. They were expecting the body to be there. And the whole world is, was expecting that the body would stay there. But they found that the tomb, the stone had been rolled away and that Jesus' body was gone. But it says in the text that the strips of linen, chapter 20, verse 6, when Peter went in and saw the strips of linen lying there, I want to go there first. So the strips were just lying there, and Jesus' body was gone. Those strips were empty. You know, he was wrapped up in mummified. And those strips were just laying there, absent the body. 
That was the first proof that something supernatural happened. And when they looked and saw that, it says in the other text that they had walked away confused and Mary was bawling her eyes out. Where have they taken my Lord? What did they do with his body? And at one point she meets the gardener who actually was Jesus. We're going to get there. That's a really exciting moment. Where have you laid him? I hope he'll get him. And she said, Mary, Mary, it's me. Such a beautiful moment. But before these beautiful moments started to take place with the linens laying on the stone slab and the rolled away stone and with Mary encountering the resurrected Jesus, see, he not only rose from the dead, but he appeared to them. And there's many witnesses that proclaim it in this book. And that's why we believe the story. But before Jesus was laid in that tomb, he was crucified. And we pick it up here in the last verse of chapter 19. At the place where Jesus was crucified. At the place where Jesus was crucified. I want to pause there and sketch that out for a few minutes. You know, in the scriptures we've learned that God taught Abraham and the people of Israel to make sacrifices of a lamb or a goat or a bull and shed their blood on the altar and cut them open with a knife. Why would God want something so weird and gross as making sacrifices on an altar? You know, we remember in the Old Testament that Abraham did sacrifices. The Jewish people made sacrifices. As a matter of fact, when the Jewish people came into power on Mount Sinai in Judea, that David had the tabernacle they were making sacrifices. His son Solomon grew up and made a temple in Jerusalem, and they made sacrifices in that temple of lambs and goats and bulls. Because sacrifices were made to help them know how serious sin was. That it was blood that would forgive their sin. It was a symbol of what God would do through His Son, Jesus Christ. The scripture says, without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. It lets us know that sin needs to be clean, that sin needs to be forgiven, that sin is very serious. And so the perfect sacrifice would be Jesus Christ, God's own Son. And so at the place where they crucified Jesus, there was a garden. And in the garden there was a new tomb, which no one had ever been laid. Because it was the Jewish day of preparation, and since the tomb was nearby, they laid Jesus there. Early in the story, we learned that this tomb belonged to Joseph of Arimathea. He was a religious ruler. He was very wealthy. And he had his tomb right outside Jerusalem, right by where they crucified people. There was a garden there. And it was hewn out of solid rock. And there was a big stone they were holding in front of the entrance. And Joseph of Arimathea, it says, was a secret believer. The reason he was a secret believer, because he came up in public, he might lose position, might even lose family, might lose friends. And see, that's why people don't want to believe in Jesus today. That's why they don't want to adamantly and positively and proactively follow Jesus today. Well, I might lose my friends. I might lose my family. I might lose my job. People are going to think I'm a Christian nut. Because I believe in Jesus and I read his word and I go to his house and I worship his name and I believe in the resurrection. Also, Joseph of Arimathea had a buddy named Nicodemus. And Nicodemus was also a Pharisee at the temple in Jerusalem. And he was also a secret believer. And it says in the text that Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus went to Pilate that night after his crucifixion and said, can we have the body? And in the text, it says they took him down from the cross. They cleaned and wrapped his body and laid him in Joseph's tomb and rolled the stone in front. He was all wrapped up, clean and wrapped up, and he was dead. Okay? And you're crucified by the Romans, you're dead. <laughs> you hang on the cross for six hours, you're dead. And those iron spikes, eight inches long. Put them right here, right here, right through both feet. You weren't leaving that beam of wood. A lot of pain, bleeding out. The reason the Romans 
crucified people is something they learned from the Persian Empire. We hate you, we don't want criminality in our town, you've been a rebel against the government, you've been a thief, a murderer, a liar, we're going to crucify you. And we hate you so much and we will make an example of you to the community, we're going to crucify you so you die slow, in pain and torture. We just don't want to kill you by chopping off your head the way they did with the Apostle Paul in the courtyard of Rome. We're going to nail you to the cross, let you bleed out in front of your family and friends, and slowly suffocate. Now, when Jesus was hanging there in the crucifixion of Christ, and he bled out, and he started to lose his breath and lose, lose his life, and he said a couple statements from the cross. He said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. They crucified Christ. They didn't know it was God's Son that they were crucifying, but it was God the Father's plan to crucify His Son, to be the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, to be the sacrificial Lamb. That story starts in Genesis and works its way all the way through to the end of Revelation. This entire Bible is about Jesus Christ. His redemptive thread planned through the Bible to forgive us. It was by faith in the sacrifice that saved Abraham. It's faith in the sacrifice of Jesus Christ that saves us today. Because we need saved. And that's where you got to start. you got to realize that you're broken. You're sinful. You're not perfect. A lot of people tell me, well, I'm a good person. Pay my taxes. I've been married 40 years. I got three kids. I've been a firefighter for 40 years. I'm a good guy. I haven't done anything wrong. I've killed anybody. I'm, I'm a good person. I pay my taxes. I'm a good guy. I was never unfaithful to my wife. The Bible says that there is no one perfect. All have fallen to the fate of sin. All have broken God's perfect standard. No one is perfect. And that is when we face the law of Moses, the Ten Commandments that everyone has forgotten. And don't put those up in our courthouse. Don't put those in our school or our library. We don't abide by those anymore. We don't like those anymore. Those make us sound guilty. Yeah, because you are guilty. It was the Ten Commandments, that's why they're so important, that Moses brought up from the mountain face the people of Israel, to face the world. That that is God's perfect standard. And you've got to recognize that and see that you're broken to understand that we need the cross. Understand the purpose and the point and the power of the resurrection. What are the Ten Commandments? Thou shalt have no other God before me. Oh, we're good at putting God before God, whatever they are. You shall not use my name in vain. Oh, we make that mistake a lot. <laughs> you shall honor the Sabbath day and make it holy. Oh, we let that one go a lot. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall honor your father and your mother. Oh, oh wow. <laughs> we our children and our teens and this generation should honor their elders honor their father and mother? Yes. You shall not commit murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not bear false testimony. You shall not be jealous or covet your neighbor's stuff. Now don't tell me that none of that's gone on in your heart. <laughs> Even though you're a really good person who's paid your taxes. It lets us know that we need Christ. Sometimes when we present the gospel, we need to let people know why they need the gospel, why they need the cross, why they need their resurrection from the dead and have hope and faith in that. We're all guilty inside and out, to some degree or another, whether you're a good person or you're a bad person. The place where Christ was crucified, he's laid in this tomb by Joseph and Nicodemus. And they rolled the stone in place, and everybody went away because the next day was their Sabbath, Saturday. Christ was crucified on Friday, hung there for six hours, breathed his last, 
And he said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. And he died. Now, the Romans cast Lot for his clothes. And Pilate and the others said, be sure he's <coughs> dead. Don't let him off the cross until he is dead. And so the Romans took their spear. The Romans had great weapons. They were trained soldiers. They knew how to kill people. He takes the spear. He puts it up between the ribs of Jesus and pushes it all the way through his lungs and into his heart. And when he pulls it back out, all the blood and water pour out. No. Now, Pastor Troy, why are you being so graphic? <laughs> so dramatic? Because the story is graphic and the story is dramatic. And if you get up here and preach the gospel of Jesus Christ, you need to say it like you mean it with all sincerity, passion, and pleading, and hope. Because if you were standing at the cross, you'd be acting like Mary and Martha and Mary Magdala and the other disciples who were standing there. John, the apostle, was standing there. And I can tell you, what they witnessed changed them. The graphic, disturbing sight. They, it says in the text, they wept. So, as a preacher of the gospel in 2024, I bring people to the graphic, dramatic moments of the Bible. Standing at the cross for a minute, taking a look at what happened. Standing outside the open tomb and know what the context of the story is. Think about the, uh, the disciples and the followers who were there. Think about what actually happened and why it happened. John the Baptist preaching for Jesus Christ and paving the way. What does it say in all the Gospels and the opening chapters? It said that he was preaching repentance to the people and baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit to get them to turn away from their sinful life. Preparing them for the kingdom of God had come. And when Jesus showed up with the Jordan River walking in front of John the Baptist and the crowds were lined up to get baptized and turn away from their sinful life and think about the kingdom of God. When John the Baptist saw Jesus Christ, he knew who he was from the Old Testament, from the times of Abraham, with Abraham making the sacrifice of the lamb on the altar. He said, behold, the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Before we look at the resurrection, we need to look at the crucifixion. Because people say, well, maybe he wasn't dead. Maybe he was just revived. Maybe he stole his body. They said it then, they say it now. No, he was dead. And they laid him in a tomb. Now, early on the next day, when it was still dark, so it was early in the morning before the sun came up, the story says that Mary Magdala went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been rolled away, 20, verse 1 and 2. So she went running back to Simon Peter, the leader, and the other disciples and said that they have taken the Lord's body out of the tomb and we don't know where he is. Well, those two sentences tell me a lot. They should tell you a lot. Mary, Peter, and John expected him to still be there. Right? Mm -hmm. Mary was running back. They've taken away the body. We don't know where it is. And that's surprising to me in reading the story. It should be surprising to you that they were confused. They were filled with doubt. They were a bit skeptical. When Jesus had said to them, and I'm going to go back here in the Gospels, listen to what Jesus said to the 12 disciples, all his followers. Mary was there. Magdala, Mary, Martha, many women, Joanna. It's recorded in Luke chapter 18, verse 31, that Jesus let them know that he would die and raise from the dead, but somehow it couldn't get into their mind. It couldn't get into their heart. They couldn't really understand what he was meaning or saying. They should have known because they should have known the scriptures. But you know, Jesus picks people, <laughs> outsiders, Rough cuts. People outside the system. You notice how Jesus didn't go to the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the religious, religious, religious rulers and leaders of Judea who were so sophisticated, 
so educated, so well dressed, so wealthy, so knowledgeable, so well spoken. No. He goes to the outcast and the outlaws and the losers because he can start with a fresh slate and they can learn who Jesus is. And Jesus said to them, Luke 18, verse 31, Jesus took the twelve aside. They're on their way to Jerusalem for the Passover feast. This is about a week or two before that happens. Jesus took the twelve aside and told them, we are going up to Jerusalem. And everything that is written by the prophets, oh, wait, wait. <coughs> Jesus said, everything that is written by the prophets about the Son of Man, Jesus Christ, will be fulfilled. That is a huge statement. Everything written about the Son of Man, that was Jesus' favorite term of himself. He was called Yeshua. He was called Christ. He was called the carpenter from Nazareth. He was called a prophet. He was called a healer. He was called a Rabboni, the Jewish teacher. But what he liked the best was Son of Man because what he's saying is, I'm going to do. I'm God in the flesh, Son of Joseph. Son of David, I'm here in the flesh, I'm, I'm one of you, I came down here to be with you, to experience what you experienced, to help you know that God the Father didn't forget about you. I'm here in person, in the flesh, showing you the kingdom of God. That's what Jesus said to the crowds. I came here to reveal the Father to you. I came here to speak the words of my Father. I don't speak the things that I want to speak, I speak the things that the Father commanded me. You. And so Jesus says that what is written in the prophets about the Son of Man will be fulfilled, which is what? Verse 32, Luke 18. He will be delivered over to the Gentiles. He will be delivered over to the Romans. They will mock him. They will insult him. They will spit on him. And they will flog him. And they will kill him. But on the third day, 1833, Luke, but on the third day, he will rise again. He took his disciples aside and the girls and told them what was going to happen as they're entering Jerusalem. It's interesting that on the day he was crucified, they wept in confusion. On the day he was raised from the dead, they were wondering who took the body away. They didn't remember what he said. They didn't believe what he said. They didn't want to hear what he said. I think that was more the case. It says here the prophets. Do you know that Jeremiah, Isaiah, Ezekiel, Hosea, Joel, Zechariah, Zephaniah, all predicted the coming of Jesus Christ. Do you know that? People say, well, what is the Bible about? And how can I trust it? How can I believe it? Isn't this just a bunch of fanatical people? But all these prophets were saying the same thing about the coming of Christ and about him being pierced and died for our iniquity, our sin, our wickedness. So, I think a good preacher reading that statement about Jesus saying that all the prophets predicted this and I'm trying to remind you of what this is about. I'm going to Jerusalem to die. You know, last week we were here waving palm branches about Jesus' triumphal entry and everyone was waving palm branches because they wanted the kingdom of God to come via the throne of David. They wanted a political kingdom a socially healthy kingdom, an economically sound kingdom. They wanted the tyranny of the Romans off their shoulders and off their backs. When they were waiting, they were expecting Jesus to be like David, his forefather. They kept saying, Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, son of David. They wanted economic prosperity. They wanted protection on their borders. They wanted economic health. But when Jesus rode in, he rode in there to conquer something more than just their convenience and their comfort and their safety. Jesus rode in there to destroy.
destroy the kingdom of darkness, to destroy death and hell and the enemy. And he conquered our death on the cross with his precious blood, and he conquered the enemy of death by rising from the dead. Stone was rolled away. The linen cloths were empty. And Jesus was not there. And he was witnessed by hundreds of people, including the disciples who became the apostles. And you think the apostles would give away their... Here's another proof, because people say, well, what's the proof? Why do you believe that? Well, all the prophets talk about Jesus hundreds of years before he actually fulfilled those prophecies. You know that Jesus fulfilled over 300 prophecies spoken by the prophets, down to the minute detail. Amen. It's nearly numerically impossible for him to accomplish one. He accomplished over 300, so there's your proof. I believe the prophets. Do you believe the professors at the universities with two PhDs tell you a bunch of garbage? Is that true? In their new scientific discoveries and archaeological discoveries, they keep getting <coughs> defunct, turned on their ear. Mm -hmm. What they taught our kids was wrong. Mm -hmm. It's not just about biblical proof, it's about scientific proof. They don't understand the mathematics of how the stars stay in place. They said that the universe was so old it was slowing down. They found out through the James Webb telescope that the universe is actually speeding up. Oh, I guess, I guess the last 40 years we told our kids in the university that it was a big bang billions of years old. I, I guess that's wrong now. Yeah, they're trying to cover that up now. That's just what I could go into, but he talks about to fulfill the prophets. Let me pick out one of the best prophets, Isaiah. You know when the apostles preached in the streets of Jerusalem and all the towns around Rome, do you know they often quoted Isaiah? Because Isaiah knew about the coming of Christ and how he was a sacrificial lamb. Listen to this. So, so interesting. Isaiah 53, beginning with verse 8, talking about Christ. Isaiah preached this 700 years before Christ showed up. Listen to what he says about Christ. For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgressions of my people he was punished. He was assigned a grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death. How did Isaiah know that Joseph of Arimathea would be a rich man and, and loan out his grave to Jesus? How did he know that? Because these were written by men who followed the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, who wrote out the Bible. That's why. Because God the Father wanted his son's story to be told. <laughs> Assigned a grave with the wicked. Though he had done no violence, nor, nor was there any deceit in his mouth, yet he was slain. It was the Lord's will to crush him, cause him to suffer. And though the Lord makes his life an offering for sin, which what did he say? And though the Father makes his life an offering, the Son an offering for sin, he will see his offspring and prolong his days. He's going to talk about the resurrection in one second. He will see his offspring, prolong his days, and the will of the Lord will prosper the land. And after he has suffered, oh, at the cross he suffered, after he has suffered, he will see the light of life and be satisfied. You know what that means? Resurrection. He will rise again. He will see the light of life. He will come back to life. By his knowledge, my righteous servant will justify many. Oh, there's the gospel. And Isaiah. The punishment and the resurrection of my son will satisfy the righteousness of God and he will justify people. And then he ends with saying, and he will bear our iniquities. Iniquities. You know, pastors and theologians throw out words we don't know what they mean. You know, what is transgressions? What is iniquities? It's us 
being human, it's us being immoral, it's us being ungrateful, it's us being selfish. And so here, Jesus says, I'm going and they will kill me. And it's to fulfill what the prophets said. And so now as we close our time, we see that Mary and Peter and John were a bit confused by the empty tomb. But this beautiful moment I want to end with is when Mary was standing outside, verse 11, John 20. Mary stood outside and was crying. This is a lot. Mary loved the Lord Jesus. Mary from Bangalore. You know that she was addicted to drugs, into witchcraft, into prostitution, and possessed by demons. And she meets Jesus, and she's miraculously healed, and becomes one of the most devoted followers of Christ. So she's outside the tomb, she's crying. She sees angels inside the tomb, sitting there where Jesus had laid. And they said, woman, why are you crying? They have taken the Lord away, I don't know where he is. She was a bit confused. She didn't remember what he said. At this she turned around and saw Jesus standing there. But she did not realize that it was Jesus. He asked her, woman, why are you crying? Who is it you're looking for? Thinking he was the gardener, didn't fully really recognize him. You know, you know why people ask, why did they recognize Jesus? Because he had a resurrected body. That's why. Last time they saw him, he looked like ground up beef. And even before that, he was just a normal man in the flesh. Well, when you get your resurrected body, you're going to look good. <laughs> you're going to look better than you look good. You're going to look better than you look now. You're going to be what? Healed, whole, perfect, pristine. You're going to be like pristine. Brand new automobile. <clears throat> so you're going to look a little different. They didn't recognize him. And so she turned around. She saw Jesus standing there. She didn't realize it was him. And he said, who are you looking for? I'm looking for the body of my Lord. They've taken it away. If you're the gardener, tell me what you saw. Tell me where they took him. And Jesus says to her, all he had to do was say your name. <clears throat> They looked at each other in the eyes and all Jesus had to do was say her name. And she recognized who he was. He said, Mary. She said, oh my goodness. She cried out in her man, Rabboni, teacher. So funny. She obviously went up to him and grabbed hold of him and hugged him. And was emotional and grateful to see him. And Jesus says this funny thing. Woman, don't hold on to me so hard. <laughs> I'm going to go see the disciples. I'm going to go back to my father. It's kind of a funny humor story <coughs> of the emotion between two people who love each other. Mary Magdalene went back to the disciples, Peter and John and the boys, and said, I have seen the Lord. So, as I end today, barely touched this story, but I got into it best I could. When Mary went back and told the boys, they came running to the tomb and she said, I had seen the Lord. So today, here in church on Easter Sunday, we're all together on this day. I want you to hear the words of Mary when she said, I have seen the Lord. Do you believe Mary? Do you believe John and Peter? Do you believe the prophet Isaiah? Do you believe that Jesus said who he was and did what he did? Died on the cross for our sin, rose from the dead, and then all his disciples, they, here's another proof. They gave their life for that message. If that message was somehow false or fake, or they were the ones that took the body and it's not really the risen Lord or the Son of God, would, would they have traveled the world preaching the gospel and each one of them were killed except John the Apostle? He's the only one who grew to old age. Would, would Peter allow himself to be crucified upside down because he was telling a false story? You've got to think about that. Paul, the Apostle Paul, planting all the churches. They 
chopped his head off in the courtyard of Rome when he went there. Of course, he was in prison a couple of years. Then they brought him out and chopped his head off. Do you think he would have went through that? Paul, John, Peter, and all the other guys, if you traced out their stories, they traveled and all got killed. They killed all the prophets. You know that? Jesus said to the Pharisees in the temple courts, was there any prophet you did not kill? Why is it that the people who tell the truth, the prophets and the apostles, all get killed? And they're willing to give their lives for a message. Do you see anyone else out there doing that for Jesus? So on this Easter 2024, I know I've gone a little over. I appreciate your patience. But I wanted you to see the empty tomb and see the witnesses who also were skeptical and doubtful. But once they saw the Lord risen, they believed. Now, today we don't see the risen Lord, but we hear the story. And that's why the story was given, the account was given, so that you might believe. All those who believe in him have eternal life. And Father, we're so thankful that your son provided this for us today. I trust that you will believe in Jesus as your resurrected Lord this morning. And we thank you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. He wants to show up and discourage. He wants to undermine. He wants to steal your blessing. But don't let him do it. We're going to be singing Victory in Jesus, 473. And it's going to go in your hymnals. We're going old school, people. We are going old school. And it's verse 1, the chorus, verse 2, the chorus, and verse 3, the chorus, and that's it. So please stand, turn in your hymnals to Victory in Jesus. In the end, the devil can do whatever he wants to frustrate us, to discourage us, to undermine our blessing. That only works if we allow it. Because Amen. he knows you lost. Amen. Yes. <laughs> yes. Amen. When Christ died for those few hours that he was in the tomb, Satan actually thought he won. And then Sunday morning came, and he realized, I ain't got nothing. So he has been trying his hardest for every believer to steal their blessing, to steal their hope, to undermine their belief. And you know what? Amen. Not going to happen. Not going to happen. Because when we sing, we go to war. And our song is victory. Victory in Jesus. Gentlemen.
part of our service here at Living Faith on this Easter Sunday morning, 2024. I know we've gone a little over. I'm sure you got plans with family and friends, but let me close our time out in a, one more moment of prayer before you go. Heavenly Father, we're just so grateful to hear the story of your son that you recorded faithfully from the gospel writers and from the apostles and from the prophets so that the following generations could hear the story and know that you're there, that you love them, that you forgive them, that when death happens, that's not the end of the story. Those who believe in Jesus Christ go and be in your presence, to be absent from the body, to be present with the Lord. Not only that, but Jesus, you said when you return, you're going to resurrect our bodies and we're going to live for eternity. That was the plan from the beginning. In this moment, as we depart, I pray you'll place your faith in Jesus Christ. It can happen here within one second, one moment in your heart. It's a transaction between you and the Father in heaven. Say, you know what? I heard the story of Jesus today about the way he died and you know, forgive my sin, the way he rose from the dead and conquers death. It's, it reveals your great love lavished upon the world that no one shall perish but all might have eternal life. Place your faith in Jesus in this moment. Trust Him as your Savior and your friend. And as you read the scriptures and spend time with Christians, the story will become ever so much more real to you. As the Holy Spirit will open your eyes, you'll become a new creature in Christ. Let that transaction happen today. As you go from here, I pray that you will walk in peace of the Holy Spirit, that the Heavenly Father will guide and guard your path, and that He'll bless your home and bless your life. As you celebrate with family and friends, talk of Jesus around the table. He's worth talking about. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. See everyone next time. Have a great day. Great job.